afternoon or good morning, depending on where you're joining us from, everyone. My name is Jesse, and I am with Exploring by the Seat of Your Pants. If you're joining us for the first time, we are all about bringing conservation, adventure, and science into classrooms around the world. And it has been such a fun day. Joe just wrapped up talking about epic Arctic exploration with the Hearts of the Ice Ladies. Earlier today, we were live in a stream in Toronto with salmon running up the screen. But today, we are going to dive in on our final program of the day on our big theme of this month. So for the last few years, if you've been joining us, space is our theme for October. We feature astronauts explorers, engineers, all these amazing people from usually across the U.S. but across the world doing just incredible work to probe the mysteries of the universe and cosmos around us. So today is no exception to that. We are joined live by Dr. Tara Rutley and she has the coolest job in the entire world. She is the Associate Chief Scientist for Exploration and Applied Research, which means she gets to work on the science at the International Space Station, the coolest lab ever designed by man ever, which you guys can actually check out any single night you want. You can look up how to see the ISS going overhead. It is as mind blowing to me now as it was when I first did it years ago. I really encourage you guys to check that out and she works for NASA. So NASA is where dreams are made. We've been having so many NASA folks on uh, this October. It has been such a fun time. So without further ado, I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Rutley to blow your mind for the next 20 minutes before we dive into the Q&A. Thank you so much for joining us today, Tara, and take us away. Hey, everybody. Hello from Arlington, Virginia, um, where it is nice and sunny. Finally, I know there are some of you who might be from the Virginia area. Uh, he, he's right. I work for NASA and it is a place where dreams come true. I've wanted to work for NASA my entire life. And so I worked really hard and I actually started to want to work for NASA when I was probably in the third grade. So um, let's get started about I don't know what I do at NASA and why I do what I do and why it's so important to you and, and to those of us at NASA, right? So I am going to share my little screen here and I'm going to move things along. Technology is the world we live in right now, right? Let's see. Okay. So here's a little bit about me. I grew up in Lafayette, Louisiana, um, and none of my parents, neither of my parents went to college. Nobody in my family had gone to college, but I knew from a young age by watching the space shuttle launches that that it was what I wanted to do. I actually wanted to be an astronaut and not just be an astronaut and, and float around, but what got me interested was watching them do experiments on the space shuttle, watching the way fire burned in little balls and watching the way fluids just creeped around and crawled around and watching even different kinds of animals that went up in space and how they behaved. And all that really got my attention. And um, when I was young, I actually got to go to space camp in high school. And that's in Huntsville, Alabama. Space camp is a real thing. You can go, I think if you start at the age of 10, I think 10 and older, uh, and you can spend a week learning about well, space and pretending to be in missions and things. And so I pretended to be the scientist in those missions. And, and the more I um, became familiar with space and got involved in space as I grew up in high school. It was really science, the science part of space that interested me. As I was growing up, everybody said, well, if you want to be an astronaut, you have to be an engineer. You have to do math. And I wasn't really interested in engineering. And I wasn't really interested in math. I really wasn't that great at math either. Um, but I was interested in science. And I was fortunate that in high school, we took a field trip, three hour drive from Lafayette, Louisiana, over to Houston, Texas, where the Johnson Space Center is. And I got to meet a real astronaut. And I got to ask him, what do I have to do to be an astronaut? What do I need to do? Just tell me, I'll do it. And he said, well, it's it's really tough getting selected to be an astronaut. You know, the, the, we don't take that many. And there are a lot of people who apply. So the best thing is to do what you love. Do what, do what, you know, astronauts need to be scientists or engineers or math or get those things, but pick the area of interest that you love because not everybody gets picked. And so you want to have done something with your whole life and your whole career that you have enjoyed. And by the way, we like to select happy, successful people to be astronauts. So that's what I did. I went to college to become uh, a, a biologist. I went for biology. Um, when I was there getting my bachelor's degree in biology at college, I loved it, but I got to meet and work with some students in engineering, in particular mechanical engineering. And I realized I needed them to help me build some ideas I had as a student for use in space. Um, and those students talked me into then getting another degree in mechanical engineering. You guys, I got a degree in mechanical engineering. I said, no, I would never do that. But I ended up doing it because they 
told me, I should say, talked me into it. And I did that. And then soon after that, NASA hired me because I had both degrees. I had mechanical engineering and biology, and they were starting a new program called the Biomedical Systems Division. And they needed someone like me who could talk both uh, to scientists and engineers to help build things like the exercise equipment on the space station and the medical equipment on the space station. So I, I, I worked hard in both biology and mechanical engineering, and I got lucky, I think, with timing of this new opportunity. And I got my dream job. Hire, NASA hired me for my dream job. Um, so I started as an engineer. How about that? But it was in it was science based engineering. And, and that's what I loved. So my whole entire career has been uh, working for the International Space Station Program. And in fact, we started the space station program just before I got to NASA in uh, I joined in 2001. So we started uh, 2000 pretty much. So we've been up there 20 years. We've had people coming and going from the International Space Station for 20 years. So there has been as there have been people in space all the time your entire life. I don't even know if you knew that. There are always people 250 miles above you, above the Earth, and they are going around the Earth once every 90 minutes. So they see many sunrises and many sunsets every day. They are going at a super speed of 17,500 miles per hour. And why are they there? Well, they're there to do science experiments. That's why they're there. The space station is a big orbiting laboratory. It's not anything else but a laboratory. Oh, and it's a place for astronauts to live. In fact, six to seven astronauts can live there at a time. And our astronauts are from around the world. So we have lots of, lots of places that our astronauts are from. And you can see the different types of experiments. Yes, we've sent fish to space. We sent fire. Students have sent butterflies to see if their wings flap differently or if they fly differently. Um, and we do a lot of, this is a picture, this is a, a video of exercise. We do a lot of exercise on the, on the space station because our bones and muscles are made for gravity. And if we don't use them because we're just floating around in space, well, we tend to, they tend to get weaker. So we need to stay strong if we want to if we want to explore places like the moon and Mars. So that's another reason why we use the space station. So we use the space station to do really new science that you can't do on Earth. And I'll explain that a little bit what I mean by that, because there's only one thing on Earth that is the strongest force that we know, but it doesn't exist in low Earth orbit once you leave the planet. It, it gets weaker and weaker. And I bet you know what, what that is. Why would we do experiments in space? Why do we care as scientists? Well, I'm gonna share that with you in a minute, but first let's watch our crew land very, diff very softly uh, on the surface as they come home from the International Space Station after six months, maybe a year's worth of stay. Um, and you can also find us online, by the way. Um, we're pretty handy in Twitter and um, Facebook and things, but let's get it to the science and space really quickly. Um, why do we do science and space? Well, I kind of let on a little bit about that, but I want you to take a look at these videos. Okay. So this one here, it's, it's, so when you have microgravity, that one force I told you about, what do you think it is? Gravity. We do things in space because we can do it without gravity getting in the way. Gravity is the biggest force we have. And, it, and it's cool when you're doing experiments on earth, but what happens Think about a science experiment you ever might have done. What happens if you take gravity away? You don't know, but, but you might be interested to know why. What happens? Well, it turns out things like things you're going to learn in school if you haven't learned already, forces like convection and buoyancy and sedimentation. Some of you may know what these things are. They all depend on gravity. Convection is when you heat something simply by mixing it because the hot air may, maybe rises to the top and cold sinks to the bottom and so it mixes. So what you're seeing here is a way, the way a fire burns in space and it burns in just a round circle like that because there is no, there is no heavy, there's no heavy in gravity. So there are no heavy molecules that sink to the bottom and lighter, warmer molecules that sink, to, that rise to the top. So you get a round flame instead of the cone flame you see on earth. Same with sedimentation. With sedimentation, what you're seeing here in green is green liquid, liquid with black 
black um, particles floating around in the liquid on space station. They won't settle to the bottom. They'll, if you shake them up, they'll float and they'll stay suspended in the liquid forever. And you can study how they interact with each other and maybe make some cool new materials. Now this one here is how bubbles behave in space. If you wanted to boil water, uh, this is what the bubbles, this is what boiling water would look like in space. Oh, I'm on my video, it doesn't, doesn't seem happy with me. Let's see if I can get it to work. No, oh, this is a cool one. I'm sorry guys, but um, if this video were working, what you would see is a big bubble forming here under, under a lot of heat. Instead of having tiny little bubbles like you would see when you're boiling water in, on Earth, instead in space, you don't get tiny little bubbles floating to the top because there is no floating to the top. There's no gravity. So instead, that bubble just gets bigger and bigger and bigger and heats up into one big bubble and it just stays there. It doesn't even heat the rest of the water. So these are all reasons why, examples of reasons why we do science in space. We can learn how fires burn in different ways we've never seen before and now we can think of new ways to put them out those kinds of things. We can even make new products like cough medicine and laundry detergent if we can understand how sedimentation works without gravity getting in the way. So those are some examples. Um, and here I wanted to share, I'm glad this video is working. This is what water behaves like in space. And it's got, what you're seeing is a blob of water, the astronauts are having fun, and there's a GoPro camera on the inside of that bubble of water. But that's not the cool part to me. The cool part to me is look at his hands. Look at his hands and what the water is doing to his hands. He told me that water just creeps right up his hands, covers everything, and eventually it covered his all crept all the way up his arm to his elbows. And you know, that's what water does in, in space. And so it's an interesting thing to study and it's an interesting thing to learn about. But also we talk about living things that change in response to space, space flight, right? We are designed, you and I, and the plants and your pets and bacteria and the cells in our body are all designed to be all designed around 9.81 meters per second squared of gravity. We have bones and muscles because we need to move our body around uh, in the heavy gravity environment. If we didn't have gravity, we don't need bones or muscles probably. And so what you're looking at on the right is also how plants sometimes respond to, to going into space. Sometimes plants don't like leaving Earth. They have to evolve for years and years and years under, under the Earth's gravity. So lots of times when we get living systems into space, they don't like it very much or, they, or what they do what they, we call adapt. They change, they adapt. Now this plant may have died, but we got pretty good at learning how to start taking care of our plants in space, how to water them correctly, Again, water behaves differently, so plants take in water differently. How to give them the right lighting, how to give them what they have on Earth. How can we give them that in space, even though they won't get gravity? And that's important for us because we wanna learn how to grow our own food so we can go and live on the moon and then even go and live on Mars. So we have a lot of work to do on the International Space Station to understand how our body changes and how we can make sure it, it doesn't change for bad, right? It stays healthy and that our plants can stay healthy so that we can we can eat them. <laughs> we want to go live on the moon and Mars. Um, and so we do science, we do science on space station for discovery uh, and benefits to those of us on Earth. And then I talked about going in, and living uh, on the moon and Mars. Um, I want to show you this video again of exercising. We do, we talked about bone health. And what you see here on the top left is a is the inside view of a normal bone. But underneath that, right, is an inside view of a bone in space if, if the person doesn't do exercise. So we get really good with doing exercise, taking all their vitamins and eating all the nutritious food that we give them. And that's how you do exercise in space. And I'm betting someone's going to ask, well, if things are floating in space, <clears throat> how can she be doing um, weightlifting? Well, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to wait until you ask me that question before I give you the answer. We'll talk about it after. This is a good video about uh, from a student. This is a student experiment. This is a spider on the top of that video. And that student wanted to know if the spider would jump on its prey like it's doing now. Its prey is tiny little fruit flies. And that spider just jumps and attacks. Can it do the same thing in space? Well, as it turns out, it could. But the interesting thing to me is right now, when that spider came back from living on the space station, it came back to Earth. Now watch it jump. It's gonna attack its prey right down here at the bottom of the screen. He's stalking it. And then look what happens when I said he, but it's a she, tries to get that, tries to get that uh, that uh, prey. She lands on her back. She falls on her back. 
she's so disoriented from having spent so much time in space that she's got to readapt to the Earth's gravity even. And eventually she jumps around and gets her prey, gets her fruit fly. But it was interesting to me because we know when astronauts come back from a long time and stay in space, they also feel um, a little disoriented and they have to do some exercises to get them back to readapting to the Earth's ground again. We can also do experiments on the outside of space station and sub subject like uh, materials to the ultraviolet radiation and the atomic oxygen and the really hot and cold temperatures in space. And then we can use those materials for things like the rover that is on the Martian surface right now. And this, I bet you guys can look at this and tell me what this is because I'm betting many of you have seen something like this. And this is an example of 3D printing on the International Space Station. And we, we tried this out a couple years ago. And it is, I usually ask you what, what, they're, uh, what you think they're printing here, 3D printing here, but they're 3D printing a wrench, a tool. And why would you do that? Well, we have to send a lot of stuff to the space station and send a lot of stuff home, but we don't like taking up all that space in a launch vehicle to send stuff to us. It'd be so much easier if we could make it ourselves and we'll need to make it ourselves if we want to live on the moon and go to Mars. So now we, to make things ourselves, we can 3D print. But we wanted to make sure that 3D printing wasn't different in microgravity um, compared to the way we do things on Earth, because if you've ever seen a 3D printer, it's printing layer by layer on top of each other, right? It's using gravity to help help hold it together and make something strong. So we took a chance here and 3D printed our own tools. And as it turns out, we had to make a few modifications, but we got pretty good at printing uh, on the space station. So now we're, we're, we're doing experiments that take, for example, lunar soil, which is called regolith, and maybe mixing that up and printing with that. Imagine if we could print our own habitats on the moon to live in. And these are what some of the reasons we're doing this kind of stuff on the space station. You can also get really neat images of, of um, weather or things happening on the planet from, from the space station. When there's a person, like an astronaut, taking these kinds of pictures, this is a picture of a volcano erupting. And when we can have astronauts take these kind of pictures, the astronauts can quickly send them down to Earth and we can share them around the world to help with disaster response when, when, when the uh, earthquakes happen or, or oil spills or things like this. And we can communicate and coordinate around the world for emergency response. Now, here's some really cool things for you all. If you've got your phone handy, you could take a picture of the screen or um, your teachers can maybe jot this down for you or you can take some notes. If you want to, if you if you have a phone or your parents have a phone, you can actually download our app. We have an app that tells you more about the space station science that we do. It's called Space Station Research Explorer, and you can download it on the iPhone app store and the Android Google Play. And then this really cool here is space station so big, it's about the size of a five bedroom house, the size of a football field. It's so big that sometimes if you know where to look and when to look at night, you can look up and see the space station go overhead. And sometimes it lasts a few minutes and you can wave to the crew. <laughs> so if you go to spotthestation.nasa.gov and you put in your zip code, it'll send you texts or emails telling you which night to go outside and look up or which morning if you're an early riser to go and look for the space station. And then we have, um, we have a Twitter handle at ISS underscore research where we tweet the coolest uh, experiment science information off the planet. And then we also have a homepage, a web page at nasa.gov forward slash ISS dash science. If you really love science on the space station, we have a database full of all the experiments we've ever done with explanations of them and videos and images. And you could get lost in that forever. <laughs> and so now with that, um, I'm happy to take questions there, Jesse. Fantastic. What a great program. That was really, really neat. I love the demonstration. I've never seen the spider thing before. A lot of I've seen 3D printing. I've seen like something that fires really cool. The spider is wild to me. Anyway. And that was a student like, experiment. Like this is the thing. And there's increasingly for students across Canada, the US internationally, there are options to get experiments up on places like the ISS, which is just my, yes. honestly, I mean, when we were in school, we had to walk uphill both ways in the snow. And the fact that kids these days right. have the opportunity to like send things to the, I, anyway, my I you also, <laughs> you shared one of my favorite things, which is the, the landing because they crash, it's like 40K, right? Like 40 kilometers an hour, 50? Yeah. Yeah. Yes. 
Hard. So it's, a car, it's a car crash. They've got to build a special seat for them. And I always right. love the thought that, you know, you sort of instinctually think that astronauts would climb out of the thing and they'd be triumphant. And they can't because they're so weak. They sort of have to be lifted by like a pilot. That's right. That's yeah. right. All kinds of medical doctors show up right at the landing site to help if needed. Yeah. But we're getting better at trying to keep them healthier um, with the exercise and stuff. Perfect. Hey, I mean, I know it wasn't a full ISS did, but Bill Shatner did it the other day. And I know. He sure did. <laughs> We've been all month long, sorry, we're going to go in a second every second. All month long, we've been telling kids, it is really the coolest time to ever be interested in space. Whether you yeah. want to be a roboticist or an engineer or an astronaut, I mean, we're going to Mars, we're going back to the moon, we're doing so many cool experiments. We've got like uh, planned missions to some of the most amazing places that could harbor life in our solar system. It's just such a cool, anyway. Yeah. Oh, so crazy. much fun. Good time to be alive. I also, uh, and I'll share these at the end, every single one of those links that you shared at the end, I've got up in a banner. So I'll make sure they have uh, them in the broadcast at the end so people can keep the learning right. experience going. But yes, let's dive in with questions. We've got four live groups with us. Anyone on YouTube, if you want to take questions in the chat or on YouTube too, all the better. But let's start with Ms. Hall's class joining us in Sharon, Ontario. Unmute your mic, guys. Come on in and take us away. Hey, Ms. Halls. Welcome in. Hello, Mateo. Hello. Hello. Hi, guys. <laughs> So uh, I just have a question, and um, does uh, time flow differently in space? Time Does time flow differently? Oh, boy, you have to be so existential to ask that question. Um, it, it may. I'm a biologist, not a physicist, but I will tell you, uh, with the astronaut program and the space station, no, we they, they use the same time and clock as we do here on Earth. So they use GMT. Now, uh, a physicist might tell you tiny little details about how time and space and who's observing, right? And and getting into uh, some of the laws of physics there from Albert Einstein, whether or not, I've heard like tiny, tiny, tiny bits of, of age, like they <laughs> age a tiny bit slowly, yeah. I've heard, um, depending, you know, and it's all a matter of to do with the way the orbit of the earth and things. I don't quite understand it, but it's so negligent that I don't even like, I just, so I, I'm like, no, <laughs> time's the same, at least in low earth orbit. I would imagine the further away you get and gravity is different. And I don't even know, we don't know what's <laughs> past, like we've never been past the moon. Right. Uh -huh. uh, although I think people with telescope astro, you know, astronomers with telescopes could tell you some mind blowing things about time, time and things. Um, uh, especially as what we know, what we, <laughs> I'm getting on a tangent, but like the stars you see at night, those are from like time. Not now, yes. yeah. billions of years ago, like not now. <laughs> so by the time light reaches us. So time is a, is a great question. It's a very deep question. It's very complicated. And I hope you find your answer. One I, day. I, like that we, I like that we went existential and stumped the scientists in our first thing. The first oh. one. The the movie that does this the best is Interstellar. Like I know that's what I was thinking, right? And yeah. so we're going. Really, how fast are we going around the Earth? Seventeen point seventeen thousand five hundred miles per hour. So yeah. fast. When you get closer and closer to the speed of light, that's when time starts to change. And we have nowhere near the capacity to do that right now. But if we got there, then yes, if you were on a rocket going near the speed of light, you'd age normally, but people on Earth would be very different. So you'd come back and like everyone you know would have aged like 50 years yeah. and you'd have gone a few months if you're going near the speed of light. It's really quasi-cosmic and, and crazy. So we'll bring it back down to... <laughs> That's um, awesome. Mr. Shuki's class, welcome in, guys. Grade five, sixes. If you have a second question for us, come on up. Hey. Hi. Lovely enthusiasm. <laughs> um, my question is, my question is, so if the Saturn moon is pretty cold and it has a lot of ice on it, um, if the sun got closer or bigger, do you think that the the water would like the ice would melt and it would there could be any life form on there? We've got an Enceladus question. I like it. <laughs> sure, sure, it would melt. Not only that, but I think everything else would change. Uh, but whatever, I don't know much about these moons um, and and the planets because again, I'm a human exploration um, expert. But um, yeah, could you imagine? I mean, everything would be out of whack. Not only the the sun would melt it, but the gravity, <laughs> the gravitational forces on that body um, would definitely. I don't even know how it would happen. I don't know what would happen. It should. It it probably would crash into the sun. It would throw everything off. Every all the orbit, the entire orbits of everything. If the sun got that close, bad. To very bad. It's a very bad. We don't want this to happen. 
There's no indication that it's going to happen. But thank you for throwing us off again. I see this is the thing with questions with children. Uh, you guys are great. great. Two, for two. two for two, guys. All right, Gosh, I'm gonna have to go ask my boss, who's the chief scientist, these questions. He has all these answers. All right, well, we'll schedule a follow-up program. But Mr. Ferguson has <laughs> been asking some great questions in chat. Uh, Hannah's got a great one. So if you want to come in and share that one, go for it. Oh, you're muted. I don't know why you're muted. You were working earlier. No, you're you're unmuted, but it didn't come through audio wise. Smack the computer. I'll I'll have you on screen and I'll Let's read it. Out. Is there we go. Out? All right, great. Uh, great program so far, Dr. Rutledge. Thank you very much. Um, Hope from my class would like to know when you were selected to become an astronaut, what's the selection process from NASA? How do they go through deciding who gets to go and who doesn't get to be? Oh, what a great question. Right, right. So I finally got my chance, right? Worked really hard. You know, in 2013, I was able to actually get selected to be interviewed to be an astronaut. So here's how it works. Every four years, NASA puts out a call for astronauts. And to be even considered, you have to have a bachelor's degree. So that's the first four years of college and a master's degree. So that's usually another two years of college. And it has to be in a technical field like science or engineering or math um, or a medical doctor or even a veterinarian. So as long as it's a technical field. Um, and so you have to meet those minimum requirements. And once you meet the education requirements, you wait till the next call, which is every four years, NASA accepts applications. Um, and there's usually about 16,000 people <laughs> that apply. And they only end up picking eight, eight people in the end, every four years, eight to 10 there. And in fact, I think in December, they're going to announce the next round of astronauts here shortly. Um, so in 2013, I was picked to come to, to come and be interviewed and only 120 of us are interviewed. So 16,000 applicants, 120 of us are interviewed. We go a week long. We stay a week at the Johnson Space Center where you go through medical evaluations, you go through psychological evaluations, you answer questions about yourself and your family, and you have a very long interview at a table full of important people and other astronauts. And they ask you questions all the way back to, they start with one everyone knows, they ask, tell us about yourself since high school. And so you have to be ready to know yourself since high school. Tell us all these things. You And so then they they ask you questions. And it's really more of a conversation rather than an, an, a formal, scary interview. And it's really fun. Um, and then and then after that week, they may call you back. They may not. Uh, and so they ultimately I was not one of the one of the eight people picked. But Anne McLean, who is an astronaut who flew, I think, last year, the year before, she was with me that week and she was selected and she's great. I can't complain. So that's how the process works. And so you just have to keep applying every four years, keep applying. And so I'm still applying. <laughs> I'll just keep applying until they just like tell me completely forget it. Don't even bother again, which they won't do, but never quit. And by the way, those of you who want to be astronauts, don't select yourself out. <laughs> Don't say, oh, I can't because I'm this or because I have this or because I said this or I do this or my grades and just apply. Let them decide. Don't hold yourself back. Let others do it. <laughs> I'm so glad you mentioned apply again and again too. Mike Massimino is one of the most public facing <laughs> astronauts. I think he went, what, four times or something like that before he finally got in. That's a big part of his book, which is really cool. Oh, yeah, yeah. And he's great. And there is an astronaut who had applied like 10 times too. I think there was one more longer than him even. So... <laughs> And they're great people, and it's just a matter of what NASA's looking for when. So you just gotta oh, keep it on. We've got a bunch of Canadians here today, and so we even have a much smaller astronaut pool right now. You've got four active astronauts, and so it's much more infrequent. Right. Uh, we had Dr. Adam Sirak, who got to like the final eight, and he's joined us for some broadcasts in the past, showing some of the pictures of what it was like doing that process. And oh, by the final stage, they're like testing your greatest fear. So his was yeah. height, so they had him like leap off a sixty-foot plunge into a pool, oh. swim through a helicopter. It was very. Is cool. that what Canada does? <laughs> yeah, we're very, we're very metal up here, Kara. Um, no, so the, like they, they really do try and pick the, the yeah. most well-equipped physically and mentally people in the world because you are in the most dangerous situation that humankind right. has ever devised and you need to be able to make really quick, really accurate, good decisions on the fly. And the That's right. Thank stuff. you for that. That's right. Yeah. Great question, guys. Um, for the groups typing in the chat live, feel, save those questions. We'll come to you. I promise we're coming. Uh, so Robinson, Miss Digby's class, we got some folks uh, in Fairfax in Virginia, grade 11 today, our oldest group. Yay. Well, guys, and take us away. <laughs> okay. 
I have a Robinson secondary school, and I have a question. So how do you submit an experiment for an idea in space? Oh, okay. So um, there are, the, I would suggest the first place you go is to the ISS National Laboratory website or Center for the Advancement of Science and Space, CASIS, C-A-S-I-S. -S. Uh, they have all kinds of information about students and how you can get into the many different programs into uh, designing an experiment for that. There's also um, a group called INCESE, N-C-E-S-S-C-E, -S -S -E, and it's, a, it's, a, it's about student spaceflight experiments. I think it's S-S-E-P. So it's this long, horrible acronym, N-C-E-S-S-E, -S -S -E, and then student spaceflight experiments. And they have calls for proposals for students to submit experiments to the space station, I think twice a year. And then there's also a program called Higher Orbits, H-I-G-E-R-O-R-B-I-T-S dot O-R-G. And this is a pretty cool little program because it's a three-day workshop that travels around the country. And if your school's interested, you go online, you, you contact them to come over and they will spend three days. They usually bring an astronaut and a scientist. Sometimes that's me. I go out there sometimes. And you spend three days designing experiments for the International Space Station and learning teamwork and things. And then you compete and you compete to get an experiment on the space station that way. So um, there are so many opportunities. If you go to CASIS, C-A-S-I-S -S dot uh, O-R-G, that's a that's a great way to enter in and, and find out what's available for students. Fantastic. And thanks for our, our Miss Diggy's class. Grade 11 is almost never asked questions. You guys are usually pretty nervous, so I appreciate that. That's awesome. Um, and I've got three of these up. So cases doesn't seem to link what it should right now, but issnationallab.org. There you go. Hello. Uh, our, our wildly, un, you know, strange acronym uh, here. So just try and write that down. And higherorbits.org. So you guys can check those out. They'll all be in the broadcast. You can watch it indefinitely. So very, very cool. Jesse, you're so handy. I try. I'll be here all week. <laughs> Uh, let's dive back in with another round of questions, guys. You guys are great. Miss Hall's class, come on back up. Unmute that mic. In fact, all our teachers, unmute your mics. It's way easier. You don't need to have them muted. You're all in the background. We can't hear you anyway. Perfect. Hey, Miss Hall's, come on back in. Yes, waiting. I know we're waiting, but come and unmute the mic. There we go. <laughs> okay, who's asking? Oh, Adam, go ahead. Sorry, about this. Um, we weren't ready. Okay, Adam. Um, I I was like watching a YouTube video about space, and it said that space smells like a burnt steak. Is that true? I've heard that, or burnt cookies. Even it depends on who you ask. But yes, I've heard that. Um, and and they know this because well, they don't take their helmets off and sniff space, but <laughs> some of the hardware that they might take back inside with them. Um, will linger that smell or um or even in the airlock will linger that smell so yep i've heard burnt cookies and burnt steak i don't know what it really smells like i'd i'd well, almost like to find out but seriously well, i want my suit on you yeah, know like don't take your helmet off but no I, I like that it's cookies and steak like it could have been like asparagus and you know raw fish and that would have been yeah. much worse so that's yeah it, it could have been much worse <laughs> Uh, all right, Mr. Yugi Class, come on in, guys, and uh, unmute your mic. I'm going to keep pronouncing your name slightly differently every time, just for you, too. Um, but yeah, come on up, guys. <laughs> yeah, tap on the shoulder. Come on in. Hey, bye, Tom. Hey. We need three eleven to be like this when they come back up. It's crazy excited. First of all, do you like what, do you like what I'm wearing? We, we very much. Thank you. It's cute. Is it a space? Is it space Kellogg's or what? What am I missing? No, no, it's it's the guy from the the Tony the Tiger. Wow. Yeah, I gotcha. Yeah. All right. Well, cool, my, my question is, um, if you got trapped in space and like there was an accident on your ship, how long would it take for you to try to float down to space? We've got. Right, let me tell you. Let me back tell you this. Yeah. Have you seen the? Have you seen the movie Gravity? Yeah. I was going to say all the pop culture references today. I, um, I, well, I went to see that movie with a, a friend of mine who, who's also a car worker at NASA. And I, I had no idea what to expect. I didn't know really what it was about until I sat there and I was like, <laughs> my jaw dropped and I was anxious the whole time because the, that would be, I'd imagine the worst feeling of just being stranded out there. Right. Um, how fast would you fall? Depends on where you started, how fast you were going when you started. Um, 
depends on where in the atmosphere. <laughs> I mean, you will get faster and faster as you fall through and you wouldn't know and no one would be able to measure that because the Earth's atmosphere would burn all that up. Um, so it, it, there's a lot of, um, it depends on how you start. Let's just put it that way. But you can start by watching the movie Gravity. Nobody burns up in their suit on re-entry, but I'm not going to give you any spoilers either. <laughs> Because you know, no, no. <laughs> that, I like that kind of stuff. That, that specific form of bad death does not happen in that movie, but many others do. Enjoy, kids. Uh, no, <laughs> uh, speaking of being stranded, uh, one thing I actually like to highlight in a lot of space programs is The Martian is to this day the greatest like uh, ad for wanting to become an engineer of all time. Like, you don't even want to PSA, just watch The Martian, and like, it's the coolest book and movie ever. Um, his yeah. more recent one, too, Project Hail Mary, is like super cool. So, great. Uh, yeah. Not only is it the greatest time to be interested in space in reality, but like if you're into fiction, there's so many amazing series and books and movies and stuff now. It's just, it's so, so cool. Anyway. Yeah. You want to hear as, as something that everybody laughs at when I, when they ask me, what's my favorite science fiction movie? I say, none. I don't watch science fiction. <laughs> I, I love it. I've never have. But, uh, but The Martian's great. I mean, I mean, the main character, the hero is a biologist, a plant biologist. So, hey, you know. Yeah. Botanists are the best. We're going to bring yep. them in later. We'll do it in the next program. <laughs> Mr. Ferguson, come on back in, and then we'll go to Miss uh, Diggy's class to wrap up in just a minute. Time flies, and you're having fun. Hi, yeah. I've got another question from Hannah. Hannah wants to know why or how do your muscles become so weak from being in microgravity? Oh, great question, Hannah. So um, you walk around every day. You climb stairs. You jump. Um, you sit. You get up from sitting. And, and just the act of walking, all those things, every time you do that, puts a load on your bones and your muscles. And that's what keeps them happy on earth. They need the load. And it's kind of a weird thing to think about because the only reason they're there is because they're there to move us around under this st strong force of gravity. Gravity is holding us down, but we need to go and get food. We need to see people, we need to get water. So we need to be able to move. So biology has evolved us to have bones and muscles to do that more so than plants. Plants can move if they need to go get food, right? They can creep, creep along in their own way, but we have bones and muscles. So if you take gravity away and you're not using them, then, uh, and you're floating around in space, uh, you're not uh, using your bones. You're not pounding on them. You're just hanging out. You're getting kind of flabby. You ever you ever sat around and just was like, I haven't done any exercise for like a few weeks. I feel kind of flabby, soft. Well, your body's really get good at getting rid of what it doesn't need because it just takes energy to keep stuff you don't need. So your body says, I'm in space now. No. Oh. Okay, you're not using bones. Let's get rid of those. Let's get rid of the muscles because it's just taking energy we don't need. By the way, you lose a lot of fluid from your body because you don't need to pump the pump. The heart doesn't need to pump so hard against gravity either. So you, 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 you let a lot of fluid out and the heart doesn't pump as hard. And guess what? The heart is a muscle too. So if the heart's not pumping hard enough, guess what happens to it too? It gets weaker. It would get weaker and weaker. And then what? You don't want your heart to, to have problems. So the body will get rid of what it doesn't use. And that's why the bones and muscles get weak in space. So that's why we have to do exercise, take vitamin D to keep our muscles healthy and eat all our calories to keep the energy going. And then we keep working those muscles and bones in space. Last thing we want to do is step off of, off a nine trip, nine month trip on our way to Mars floating around. You step on the planet and you break a hip, right? Yeah. Nobody wants that. We have to figure out how to keep our astronauts healthy to, on the way to Mars. I, th th I mean, I always love when we get this question. That was a very perfect detailed answer, but I wanted to take a chance to segue into something that I think is really, really cool for students as well. So one of the ways that we test to become an astronaut and be in zero G is to go in a really, really big pool called the neutral buoyancy <laughs> lab, which is the sciencey term for a really, really big pool. And so the closest analogy you can get to what it's like to be in zero G and to have that lack of effect is go swimming. If you're lying in your back in the water, do you feel like it's taking a lot of effort to hold you up? It's so nice and relaxing for your muscles. Same deal, but if you're in space, it can be a many month ordeal, which is why they need to train and have all this research to make sure that people can withstand it. Um, I, yep. lied, I lied a minute ago when I said we're going to go live to Miss Digby's class in a second. I'll come to you in just two seconds, but a great follow up question just came in on YouTube from Miss Neely's group. So, how okay. long do you live in space? We don't know. We don't know. The longest a person has ever lived in space was a Russian, actually, uh, I think over just over 400 days. Wow. Yeah, and that I don't think that that was planned. That was on the Mir space station, and there was a lot happening back then. Um, <laughs> so people hear about Scott Kelly being the 
being having stayed in space for a year, but there were two or three before Scott. Wow. Um, the, the difference is we we document Scott and we document all our astronauts as they stay on the space station longer uh, than six months. So yes, for the space station, the longest we've had is about a year. Before that, it was just over 400 days. And we don't know how long a human can stay in space. We want to figure that out. We, we will figure that out either with space station or with the moon. And there's lots of science being done right now to try to make these graphs of how the body behaves and see how far out that curve will go. How, how many months, how many years, how, what's that curve gonna look like for all the body's systems? I'm so glad you mentioned Scott. Like the Scott and Mark twin study is like the coolest thing ever where you have two yeah. people as identical as possible. And you can chart one on earth and chart one in space and see how that difference is. I like the mirror story though. It's more fun when you miss your bus back to earth and you're like, man, another hundred days. How does that happen? <laughs> <laughs> well, time flies and you're having fun. Let's wrap up with one final question. Go back to Robinson School. Come on in guys and take us away. Hello. So our Hi. question is, uh, has anything ever been born in space and can fish be in space like alive? Ah, born in space. So when you say born, I think mammals. Hat. So no, no mammals. But ha and, and by the way, we've tried to have um, rodents reproduce and they don't like it. They just won't. They won't procreate and they won't make next generational babies. They just don't like being in space. Um, but we have had fruit flies have multi-generational um, uh hatchlings or, or life, life uh, multi-generation of, of offspring. So fruit flies is one, C. elegans, worms is another. I'm trying to think of what else. Um, I'm sure there are more, they're just, they're just not gonna be mammals. They're not gonna be vertebrates that we, have, we haven't we have done. I don't think we've done any kind of vertebrates like that. And then fish swimming around and- Oh, fish. yeah. Yeah, um, I, yeah, I think we've had multi-generational fish too. There are madaka fish. Those were our Japanese colleagues. We have a fish tank, an aquarium up there. How nice is yes. that? I love it. Uh, one thing I want all our classes to look up, tardigrades, just in general, are like the coolest thing ever. Um, yeah. But they link <laughs> the space station in a neat way. I'm just gonna leave you guys to look that up, the creature, the story, everything about it, super, super cool. Super cool. Uh, what I wanna do now is in our last couple minutes, just highlight some of the stuff that Dr. Rutley shared with us today. You guys have the chance to keep the learning going and I'll pass this along in an email as well. But spotthestation.nasa.gov. Go tonight, see the International Space Station. It will blow your mind to think that there's people there just circling around and around. Very cool. She also highlighted NASA.gov, ISS Science. No government agency ought to be as good at doing education as NASA is. They are amazing. They've got the best resources. It's super, super cool. Everyone should check it out there or on Twitter at ISS underscore research. And then we highlighted all sorts of stuff. The Space Station Research Explorer app, super cool. ISSNationallab.org. <laughs> uh, higher orbits, uh, check all those out, super, super cool stuff. And one thing that I always like to highlight because I love it personally, you know, if you are an engineer, if you're a scientist, fantastic. You can end up in a role like Dr. Rutley and blow people's minds and do amazing stuff. If you want to get into space in a lot of ways, as a business person, an administrator, a cook, a whatever, there's lots of options. And one way of highlighting that in the coolest way is the Visions of the Future series. So NASA has these travel posters for a future yep. where we're on Mars and Ceres and Jupiter's moons, we're exploring all these places. There you go, take a picture, yeah. <laughs> That's cool, I'm gonna go there. <laughs> so literally, I have these like printed off in another room where they're just such beautiful ways of exploring and thinking about the cosmos. I encourage every kid to check them out. Um, Great. Right, I think this has been so much fun. Is there a last message you have before we bring back in the kids to say goodbye before we wrap up today? Whatever it is you love, just go for it, don't quit. Make sure it's safe and legal and have fun. Just don't quit. Awesome. I love that. It's something that we hear from astronauts and cave divers and conservationists and more. It's a really important message. And so now what we do can end every broadcast, as you, you may not know. Miss Hall's class, Mr. Shuki's class, Mr. Ferguson, Mr. Hey, 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 Mr. Hey,